We're now going to consider length contraction. So it turns out that observers in two different inertial frames don't necessarily agree on the length of an object. So let's have a look at why that is. Let's consider a stick which has a length LO in its rest frame. Now the rest frame is the frame at which the stick does not appear to be moving. Let's call the rest frame of the stick the primed frame. So S prime is the frame at which this stick appears to be at rest. And what we're going to consider is, well, how long does the stick appear in the unprimed frame, the S frame, in which the stick is moving with a speed u along the positive x axis? Now, in the rest frame of the stick, the primed frame, we've got one end of the stick at xb prime and one end of the stick at xa prime. And we've said that the length of the stick is LO in this frame. So we've got LO is equal to xb prime minus xa prime. Now, in the S frame, where the stick is moving, we've got one end of the stick at xb and one end of the stick at xa. So the length of the stick in this frame we'll write as L parallel to indicate that the reference frame is moving in a direction parallel to the movement of the stick. And we've got L parallel is equal to XB minus XA. Now we know how to transform positions from one frame to another. We can use our Lorentz transforms. So we have that X prime is equal to X minus UT divided by the square root of one minus U squared on C squared. So we can write that L zero, which is equal to XB prime minus XA prime is equal to XB minus UTB divided by the square root of one minus U squared on C squared minus xa minus uta divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared on c squared. Now we can rearrange this to group like terms together. So we can write this as xb minus xa minus u times tb minus ta divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared on c squared. Now we've said that xb minus xa, well that's L parallel. So we can replace that with L parallel. And TB minus TA, let's have a think about that. When we were measuring the length of our stick in the S frame in which the stick was moving, we took the measurements of the XB position and the XA position at the same time. It's like we took a photograph and measured exactly where those two ends of the stick were at that same time. And so TB is the same as TA, and so TB minus TA is equal to zero. So we can write in this case that LO is equal to L parallel divided by the square root of 1 minus U squared on C squared, which we can then rearrange and say, well, L parallel is equal to LO times the square root of 1 minus U squared on C squared. So this is why this is known as length contraction. In the frame in which the stick is moving, the lengths appear shorter by a factor of 1 minus u squared on c squared over the rest length of the stick. So let's have a look at an example problem that we can solve with this now. So the question, a cube has a side length a in its rest frame. What is the volume of the cube in the frame moving with a speed v parallel to one of the sides? Okay, so let's start by drawing a little diagram. Here we've got a cube with sides of length a. And we're going to consider it moving in a frame parallel to one of these sides. So let's let it move this way with a speed v and we're viewing this from the s prime frame and we'll call this axis here the axis along which it's moving our x axis. So let's first of all consider what happens in the y direction this direction here. So in the y direction there is no motion and so because there's no motion, no length contraction occurs. So the length is still equal to A 
in the S frame in the Y direction. Now the same thing in the Z direction, in Z direction, which is this one, length is A. However, in this X direction, that's the direction that we're moving, so we will need to apply length contraction. So we derived the formula that the frame in which it's moving is the length is given by L0 times the square root of 1 minus U squared on C squared. So in this case, we've got, well, our A parallel, the length in the frame in which it's moving, is equal to the length in its rest frame, which was A, times the square root of 1 minus. Now the movement between the frames in this case is V. So we replace this with V squared on C squared. So this tells us that the volume, which is the length times the width times the height, is equal to A times A times A root 1 minus V squared on C squared. So that is equal to A cubed times the square root of 1 minus V squared on C squared. So now that we've learned about length contraction, we know enough to go back and resolve why there was a null result to the michelson morley experiment. So this shows the diagram that we produced before where we've got this horizontal arm and we calculated the total time the light spent in the horizontal arm here and we've got the vertical arm here and this is the total time that the light spends in the vertical arm. Now according to length contraction, This affects the length in the direction parallel to the direction the object is moving. So in this case, length contraction will affect the horizontal arm, but not the vertical arm. So length contraction will change the length of the horizontal arm. So the length in our frame through which this is moving is given by the length in the rest frame, which was just L times the square root of 1 minus U squared on C squared. So to get the time in the horizontal arm, we need to replace this L here with L parallel. So we have this is equal to 2 L parallel times C over C squared minus U squared. So this is equal to 2L times C times the square root of 1 minus U squared on C squared over C squared minus U squared, which is equal to 2L. Now I'm going to square this C and put it inside the square root. So that becomes C squared minus U squared, C squared on C squared. Those will cancel over C squared minus U squared. So I've got the square root of c squared minus u squared over c squared minus u squared. So this is equal to 2L over the square root of c squared minus u squared. Now we end up with the result that these two times are equal. So what we've now learned is that, well, the light actually spends the same amount of time in each of the arms. If the light is spending the same amount of time in each of the arms, then it will experience the same phase shift in each of the arms. And so when it comes back together, it, it will once again be perfectly in phase. And this explains the null result from the michelson morley experiment. We're not going to end up seeing interference fringes because the light has spent the same amount of time and undergone the same phase changes in each of the arms.